Uh, so first off, uh, thanks everybody for coming out today. Uh, hopefully everybody had a good conference. Uh, thanks to OWASP for having us. Um, so today we're going to be talking about practical tips for running a successful bug bounty program. So I and Spend, we both work at Bug Crowd. And while there, um, we've helped launch hundreds of bug bounty programs. And through that, we've, you know, have some ideas and tips on how to make your bug bounty program more successful. So that's kind of the information we want to share here. Um, so just for some quick background, this slide's not advancing. There we go. I don't know what was wrong. Okay, uh, so my name's Grant. Uh, currently, I'm a technical account manager at Bug Crowd. Uh, I work with the customer success team to help create successful bug bounty programs for clients. Uh, before that, I was an application security engineer at Bug Crowd, meaning I validated vulnerabilities that came into bug bounty programs that we manage. Um, before that, I spent a couple years at White Hat Security, also as a security engineer. And I enjoy traveling, hence uh, here in Rome. And uh, I also enjoy making music. And I'll turn this over to Spen. Thanks. Just try and clip this here. Um, yeah, my name is Spend. Uh, I'm an application security engineer with Book Crowd still, uh, and also a team lead, uh, leading the team of the engineers there that do the validation services. I'm a bug hunter myself, so I do a fair amount of bug hunting when I have free time. And I'm also a gamer, I like to play video games, and that's basically how I waste most of my time. Cool, so without further ado, we'll start with bug bounties. Um, I just want to know if anybody in the room does not know what a bug bounty is. Please raise your hands. Awesome, everybody knows, move forward. So just a small history, a brief history. Um, Buck Bounty started as far back as 1995. So there was Netscape, which were uh, receiving a lot of uh, bug reports, some of which were actually uh, uh, security vulnerabilities, which had security impact. And they, they figured out that this is really useful for them, so they decided to, uh, to incentivize this. And uh, the best incentivize is, of course, rewards, and in this case, monetary rewards. So uh, they just started paying out cash for uh, bug reports that actually had security impact. And this worked really well, so a lot of companies started to do that, such as Google, Facebook, and now, uh, lately we have uh, a lot of people doing this, organizations like the Pentagon and a lot of other companies. Cool, so you might ask yourself why, uh, why run a bug bounty, or why would you invite uh, people to try and hack into your systems? And the answer is, they are doing it anyway. Uh, by having systems that are connected to the internet, you are constantly being scanned or being attacked by some malicious people that are trying to hack and find vulnerabilities in your system and use them for whatever reason they, they use them. So why not just make use of, of this <coughs> and try to turn these people into ethical people and to report the vulnerabilities they find in your system to you so that you can fix them and they can also make profit by, by you giving out the, them uh, rewards. Uh, so you can ask yourself, well, who are these people that are going to hack into your systems? It's people from all over the world. It's people with, uh, at different ages. They have different skill sets. They have different backgrounds. Uh, they have dealt with different technology. And therefore, it, it, therefore, bug bounties work that well because some guy out there has worked with a technology that you are using on your systems, will know these technologies very well, and will know how to break into them. And if they are willing to report this, which they are in, case, uh, in cases when they will get the rewards, this is a benefit for, for both parties. Um, cool. So what's the value in a bug bounty? Well, first of all, uh, you get a lot of eyes looking at your applications. Like in a traditional penetration test, you get two, maybe three people uh, looking at your applications for, for a fixed period of time, and then they come up with a report, and that's it. In bug bounties, you will have thousands of people looking at your applications 24 hours a day trying to break into them, and when they find the way, they will report it to you because you are offering rewards. And the benefit for you is, of course, you can fix them and be more secure. Um, another benefit is that you only play, pay for results. So if you have a really good development team and they're doing their job, they're making secure applications, then you will receive little or no vulnerability submissions, which means you don't pay because uh, researchers are trained to to receive a reward only if they find something. So they, if they engage in the bug bounty, they will, they will know that. And yeah, of course, uh, but if having a bug bounty and uh, uh, you show that you care about security, you, you care about fixing and making your systems 
uh, more secure, and this will reflect uh, positively with the clients and, of course, the industry, uh, whichever company uh, you're working on. Cool. So Grant's going to talk about how to do all of this. Let's see how this works. Cool. Um, cool. So Shpen talked about... Uh, why you would want to run a bug bounty program. So let's talk about how you would run a bug bounty program. Um, so typically we break it up into two sections. Uh, you have your pre-launch and your post-launch. Uh, so pre-launch is setting up the, uh, what we call a bounty briefer. It's a single page document that contains all the information that researchers are going to need. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, and then there's also the post-launch. That's after your program goes live and uh, you know, tips for managing that. That's what Spen's going to cover. So that's sort of how everything's broken up here. Um, but before we do that, there's a couple things we want to talk about really briefly. Um, I don't know why it doesn't like my doesn't like my finger. Um, all right. So first off, uh, offering rewards is the best way to get researchers to test on your application. Um, you know, some people you can do a responsible disclosure program. You know, you don't have to offer money, uh, and a lot of people, you know, may offer swag. But I don't know if you've ever tried to ship a T-shirt to, say, Egypt or Pakistan. Uh, it's fairly, you know, hard. The easiest way is just to offer rewards. Uh, so that's something that we do encourage people to do: is offer rewards. Um, additionally, um, touch the code, pay the bug. That's the golden rule of uh, bug bounties. Uh, whether you're just, uh, you know, making like a, you know, a change to the documentation or you're, you know, making a massive system-wide fix, uh, you should always reward the researcher if their report uh, caused you to make a change. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind as well. And finally, um, this is sort of the recurring theme uh, when putting together a bug bounty program, is that it's you and them, not you versus them. Uh, traditionally, there's sort of like this adversarial sort of relationship between researchers and companies. Um, and, and really kind of try to put yourself in, in the mindset of, of working with the researchers. And that's what's really going to get you the great results uh, out of running a bug bounty program, is working with the researchers and put yourself in their shoes. Uh, and that's how the, you know, you'll get great results. So. Pre-launch. Um, so before we go anywhere, uh, let's talk about step zero. Step zero is, do you have the basic resources and requirements to run a bug bounty program? At the bare minimum, this looks like uh, you know, at least one security professional that can dedicate a substantial portion of their time towards managing this program. This shouldn't be something that is added onto somebody's already heavy workload. Uh, you, know, you really should be committed to running a bug bounty program. That's where you're going to see the best results from that. Um, so if you don't have that person that can dedicate those resources, uh, that person may need to be hired or you may need to outsource the management of your program. Um, and uh, also keep in mind that this doesn't just affect you. You know, you may be ready to run a bug bounty program, but keep in mind that this also potentially affects a number of other people within the organization. Uh, for instance, it often it will affect, uh, you know, uh, project owners, uh, developers, um, uh, it potentially even goes out to your marketing and PR teams as well. So there's a lot of people that could potentially get involved as a bug bounty program runs. Uh, so make sure that you, you loop all those people in and it's a you know, collaborative effort um, when putting together a bug bounty program. So uh, now that we've covered that, uh, let's talk about scope. Um, so scope is the most important thing on any bug bounty brief. And you're going to hear me say the word brief. And again, when I say brief, I'm talking about just a single page document that has all the information, uh, you know, telling researchers, hey, you know, uh, this is what you can test, this is what you can't test, etc. Like if you go to like uh, for Facebook, like it's facebook.com forward slash white hat, and it's just one page that has all that information on it. Um, so uh, the first thing to keep in mind is leave nothing open to interpretation. Uh, so when, when building your scope, uh, make sure that you take a step back and put yourself in the researcher's uh, point of view and really evaluate your, your scope from a third party perspective and say, hey, could this possibly be misinterpreted? So a really simplistic example of this would be, you know, you have myapp.com forward slash app. And you just put that up there and you say, hey, you guys can test on this. If I'm a researcher, the first thing I do is I, I don't, well, okay, so I don't quite know what that means. Like, does that mean that all of myapp.com is in scope or is it only forward slash app? Um, and that ambiguity, you know, if you want them only to test on forward slash app, you know, some researchers are probably going to go off and test on myapp.com. And so they, you run the risk of them going too far or them not going far enough. So make it, make it absolutely clear, you know, what you want researchers to be testing. 
the second part goes sort of hand in hand with this. Um, it's understanding your attack surface. Um, so again, going back to you know, myapp.com. So you say, okay, we're just gonna test all of myapp.com. So you just say, myapp.com is in scope. Uh, the problem is I log in at login.myapp.com, the accounts are at account.myapp.com, uh, API is api.myapp.com, and so on and so forth. Um, and so again, you run into the, the situation where as a researcher, do I, do I test on all those subdomains or is it just myapp.com, which is you know, just some for sure where? And odds are you probably actually meant for them to be testing on all those subdomains. However, if we go to the other extreme, you don't wanna go, well, Okay, maybe you do. In some cases, you wanna make sure that you understand your attack surface. So you can go, you might say, okay, so we'll solve this by going star.domain. That means like all your subdomains are in scope. Uh, the issue with this, and this isn't an issue, just to be, well, okay, so we really encourage people to go star dot. Like that's great. From a researcher point of view, like that's like great to test on because you can find crazy subdomains that you know are wildly vulnerable and you can have some fun. But when setting up your scope, if your goal is to have my app tested, um, the very same thing that makes it great for researchers could make it bad for you. Um, so researchers will go off and they'll find a you know, crazy you know, staging subdomain from like seven years ago. And that subdomain is vulnerable to everything under the sun. Uh, they're gonna find a ton of vulnerabilities. You're gonna be expected to pay for those vulnerabilities and the entire budget that you had set out for my app ends up getting spent on this other staging server. Not to mention, not to say that you know, those findings aren't worth having, but when setting up the scope of your program, make sure that you take into account all the different, you know, uh, how, how big your attack surface is. Um, so that's something to keep in mind when building this. Um, the next point here is uh, to understand that researchers follow the path of least resistance. They're like any other force of nature. Um, and that'll sort of take us into our next slide. Um, you know, so if you stand up uh, you know, your iOS app and then you have a super vulnerable web app, as a researcher, you're probably just gonna go hit you know, the, the vulnerable web app. It's easier to test on, um, et cetera. Um, so if you want people to test on you know, your iOS app, say like 80% of your traffic is through your mobile apps and you know, only 20% is through the web, you should probably call that out to researchers. So that's, that's a target that you may care about. You know, hey, test our mobile apps or test our mobile APIs or something to that extent. Um, because otherwise, researchers aren't gonna know that information. So you wanna make that clear and call that out to researchers. Uh, additionally, vulnerability types. Say you just deployed you know, a new uh, anti-CSERF uh, protection. Uh, maybe you wanna, you wanna see, like researchers again don't know this, so call that, call that out to them. Say, hey, uh, you know, we just deployed this, uh, tell us if you can break it, and if you can break it, you know, we'll attach a reward to that, you know, like, a, like a bonus or something to that capacity. Um, and additionally, functionalities. Like again, they don't know, you know, unless they're reading like your, your um, just forgot what they're called, but you know the logs when you, when you update your application, the change logs, um, unless they're reading the change logs, uh, they're not gonna know when something's brand new on your application. So call it out to researchers. Hey, you know, we just updated the account features. You know, hey, uh, go test on that. You know, tell us what you can find. Uh, so things that you really care about, call those out to researchers. Um, because again, they're not gonna know this stuff. Uh, it may seem intuitive to you, um, but they don't know. Um, so how do you do this? Talked about it already, uh, incentives. Uh, create incentives for researchers. So attach bonuses to um, you know, these focus areas that you want them to hit on. And an alternative to this is creating a, uh, a private uh, focus program. So you have your public program that everybody's testing on, and there's, you know, they just submit you know, for the whole scope of everything. And then you can take a smaller subset of those researchers and put them on a private program uh, to have them you know, test areas that you want you know, specifically called out for them to test on. Um, okay, cool. So we talked about uh, what we do want researchers to test on. Almost as important, if not just, actually it's probably just as important, is exclusions, things that you don't want them to be testing on. Why is this important? Um, again, put yourself in the researcher's point of view. Uh, everything that, you know, I don't have to write a report for or search for, you know, you don't wanna waste the researcher's time. So if you don't tell me that you don't care about something up front, I may report it to you and I wasted time on that report and you waste time validating that report or looking at that report um, and nobody really ends up winning here. So make sure that you call it out to researchers in advance, you know, the things that you don't care about um, on your bounty brief. So there's a couple areas that, you know, are commonly not cared about um, or things to consider when thinking about what you know you may want to exclude, 
so the poster child for uh, you know, low impact, low hanging fruit would be something like uh, click jacking or maybe like a soft fail on your SPF record. Um, you know, these are things that you know, anybody can find in about 20 seconds with almost no you know, experience or skills whatsoever. Um, can click jacking potentially be an issue? Yeah, it can, um, but do you want to pay somebody $200 for something that took them 30 seconds to find? Uh, that's your call. Uh, but whether you want to pay for it or you don't want to pay for it, uh, make sure that's called out on the brief so that researchers know, hey, don't submit clickjacking. It'll save you a lot of time and a lot of uh, a hassle um, if that's something that you don't care about. And there's, there's a lot of different like, low-hanging fruit. Uh, you know, other, other examples of this would be like stack traces that you know, don't contain sensitive information or something to that capacity. So there's a lot of these things to sort of take into, take into account, you know, things that you may not consider to be issues. Um, Intended functionality. Uh, this is another one that we actually see a fair amount. So say you have a CMS with an HTML editor in it. Uh, a researcher is going to go in there and they're going to put SVG on load equals alert one. And they're going to see that fire somewhere. And you know, to you it's intended functionality. Like, hey, that's an HTML editor. That's kind of what it does. But to the researcher, like again, put yourself in the researcher's point of view. If they don't submit it and this wasn't called as out of scope, somebody else is potentially going to submit it and they may get paid for it. So as a researcher, whether or not like you know, it is or isn't, you know, intended functionality, you're probably still going to submit it because why not? You, uh, you want to be the first to submit, that's who gets paid. Um, so make sure you call those things out. Say, hey, you know, we know there's some HTML editors here, here, and here. Uh, don't test on those. And there's other things that are intended functionality too. Um, so just understand how things could potentially be misinterpreted by researchers. And again, it saves them time, it saves you time. Uh, so everybody sort of wins when you th go through these. Um, other, other things to consider are known issues. Um, so ideally, you know, your known issues are probably fixed like prior to running a bug bounty program, but in reality, you probably can't fix all those issues. That said, if you can, we really encourage you to call those out on the brief. Um, uh, say, hey, you know, we know that you know, CSERF is broken in, in these places. And uh, you know, save the researchers some time. And again, because everybody's going to go find these issues, and they're going to submit them to you, and then you're going to say, hey, these are known issues. And again, put yourself in the researcher's point of view. So you spend some time you know, working on the application, uh, and you, know, you submit this vulnerability. And then they come back, and they say, hey, we found out about this you know, uh, two months ago via pen test. Uh, from a researcher's point of view, like, how does that make you feel? Like that really de-incentivizes you as a researcher because what else was found on that pen test from two months ago? Um, like, you know, is everything else I'm going to submit just be known issues? And you know, how how much more time am I willing to sink into you know testing this application? Uh, you know, that may not get me any money out of it. So that's something to consider and something to keep in mind. Um, why known issues can be an issue. Um, Accepted risks. Um, so if we look at Google's uh, bug bounty program, they don't, they say not to accept uh, open, or they say not to submit open redirects. That's perfectly fine. Like the open redirects is part of the OWASP top 10. Yes, it's a vulnerability, but Google has other mitigations in place for it, or, and they just decided that, hey, you know, this isn't something that we want you to submit. Um, so call that out to researchers. Like if there's something that you don't necessarily care about, and it's actually a vulnerability in, in other contexts, they're going to submit it. Uh, it's perfectly fine to say, hey, this isn't something that we care about. But again, make sure researchers know, because again, if, if, if I can find an open redirect on there, and you don't say you don't accept open redirects, I'm going to argue that this is an issue, and you're going to argue that, you know, hey, this doesn't matter to you, but I'm going to say I should get paid, and so on and so forth. And again, nobody wins. And, and uh, you know, researchers talk to other researchers, and you want, you want researchers to like your program, bottom line. Um, because again, I don't know if I've touched on this already, but there's a bunch of other programs that researchers can be testing on. You're actively competing for their attention to be testing on your program. So this is something to keep in mind. Uh, finally, uh, issues resulting from pivoting uh, is something else that we, uh, you know, uh, is something that you want to call out to researchers. So say somebody finds SQL injection, um, and then through that SQL injection, they're able to find that you insecurely hash uh, your passwords. Uh, is that something that you want to pay for? Uh, if that's something that you want to pay for, you should tell them, hey, you know, we accept you know, pivoting and second level you know, vulnerabilities. If you don't want to pay for that, uh, again, call that out. Say, hey, stop, stop as soon as you get like, incorrect syntax near. Like, you know, don't, even, you know, don't even try anything. Um, make it clear to researchers how far they should be testing. Again, save them time, save you time. 
Uh, so let's talk really quickly about uh, the environment. Uh, so when setting up your environment for researchers to test in, there's typically two options, production or staging. Uh, typically, we try to push people in the direction of staging. There's a lot of advantages to running staging. Uh, first off, um, if it falls over, it doesn't affect uh, production users. Uh, hopefully, there's no PII on it. Um, uh, you can do things like uh, fake credit cards, et cetera. A lot of advantages to, to running on staging if you, can, if you can handle it. A lot of people can't. Um, but whatever you do, production or staging, make sure that your application can stand up to uh, testing. Uh, you'd be surprised at how many applications actually fall over once you get 50 people throwing burp at it. Um, a lot of them, even production applications fall over. Uh, so you want to make sure that you know, it, it can stand up to that. Um, also, uh, things to keep in mind, contact forms, feedback forms. A lot of times those will go to your marketing and sales teams. Uh, keep those in mind. Maybe tell researchers not to automate those because you know, they might generate thousands of leads. Again, this has, these are real things that have, have, have caused real problems. Um, so things to keep in mind. Um, uh, pen testing requests, make sure you file those with AWS, Heroku, whoever you're using. Um, and also make sure the rest of your security team's aware of this, so that they're not getting woken up at you know 3 a.m. for IDS or IPS alerts, you know, saying that you know they're actually getting hacked. Um, uh, there are um, when when creating your environment, just keep in mind that there are special sort of uh, environments that you can run. Bug bounties aren't limited just to web apps. Uh, this is something that you know we're, we experiment a lot with at Bug Crowd, and something that we've had a lot of good success with. Uh, you know, we've tried testing on IoT devices. You know, where you send them out to researchers, and they you know physically test on a device. Um, also, CTF type environments. So we've actually you know you uh, you have them like. Uh, you allow them access into your network, and then you say, hey, if you can root this box, then you're, you get you know, like $10,000 or some, some like set lump sum or like objectives. And these have been pretty successful in terms of like getting researcher engagements and everybody's like, it's, it's a fun way to test. You know, there's a single thing that you're going after and it's no hold barred, you know, however you can do that. Uh, minus social engineering typically. Um, but yeah, so that's something to consider that, you know, uh, your environment doesn't have, there's a lot of different ways you can apply and leverage the power of using the crowd. Um, finally, researcher environments. Uh, try not to have shared researcher environments because they tend to look like this, XSS all over the place. Uh, you have 50 people on a single instance. Uh, you know, if they're all admin accounts or somebody can get privilege escalation, they start, you know, deleting other users and it just turns into a mess. And if you have XSS, you know, you're just clicking through endless prompt boxes. Uh, it, it can generally be a mess. Try not to share environments between researchers. Uh, that'll uh, save you some headaches and the researchers some headaches. Because again, if I'm a researcher and the environment gets broken, I'm going to go off, I'm going to test somewhere else, and then you've just lost a valuable resource. Uh, let's also talk briefly about access. Again, this comes back to the idea that you want researchers testing on your application. Uh, so easier equals better. Like, like make it easy. Make, them, make, them, uh, you know, make it easy for somebody to self-provision credentials, uh, to gain access to the environment. If, if they're an international, you know, if there's like restrictions, like it can only be like NATO countries or something like that, maybe put a proxy that you know, uh, international researchers can come in through so that they can hit your application. Uh, try to make it easy for them. You know, uh, uh, provide you know, API documents uh, credit cards, what, whatever, whatever you can give to researchers to make it easier, uh, that's hugely helpful and appreciated by researchers. Like, just to be clear, like, researchers recognize this sort of, like, when you put effort into running your bounty program, you can tell, like, within two minutes of, like, okay, these people want this program to be successful, and these people don't want it to be successful. Uh, and you want to you wanna be in that first category. You want to be perceived as, as actually you know, making a concerted effort towards running a successful bug bounty program. Finally, uh, no shared creds. Uh, we see this way too much. Uh, people will try to come in and they'll say, hey, here's one set of creds, everybody go test with it. You can probably guess what happens. The first guy logs in, changes the password, nobody else can log in, and everybody leaves and goes and, goes and does something else. Um, so again, make sure that you keep these things in mind. These are all of these are, are actual things that you know, we've, we've encountered in our day-to-day -day, uh, operations that will help you be successful. Um, and then remember, it's you and them. I, I think I've probably drilled that into the walls a lot, but working with researchers is the key to having a successful bounty program. Um, and so it, it's teamwork. Uh, and so as long as you can keep that in mind, you're, you're well on your way to having a successful bug bounty program. So now I'm going to turn this over to Spen. He's going to talk about what happens after the program goes live.
cool. Um, yeah, Grant mentioned uh, a really important part of a bug bounty, which is being prepared for the storm. Um, we're going to talk now about what happens once the program launches. And this first slide is just a summary of what Grant said, just because it applies a lot to when the program starts. And if, if we don't follow uh, a lot of these advices, this is what's going to happen. So you don't have the resources to manage all the incoming reports, which are a lot, because researchers want to be the first to submit and get a reward. And then um, if you have uh, bad or unclear exclusions in, in your scope, they're going to submit stuff that you're not interested, and then you have to pay those rewards, and then it's going to be bad rewards, and just falls, everything falls down. So um, in order to, to manage a bug bounty uh, good um, and, and efficient, is it's all about speed. It's all about being able to go through the submissions, uh, validate them that they are actually um, really sec real security impact uh, submissions, and then let the researcher know, and if you can, also fix them. Um, so this is a uh, couple of steps, a um, couple of points actually, which, which uh, should be in a submission that will help you do the, the process really fast. And it's good for the researcher because they know what to submit if they see this, but also for the company because they can look and if a, if a submission is missing some of these points, it's, it's probably a good idea to, to just ask for this information before you start investing time to reproduce the issue. So reproduction steps are really, really important. You want to know where in the application and how you can find that vulnerability, like what the researcher did to find it so that you can quickly reproduce it on your end, make sure it's valid, and then move forward with it. Uh, screenshots, if, if the submission has screenshots, definitely they help a lot. You look at the screenshot and it can guide you to, to where the vulnerability is and what it is or what it looks like. And then uh, proof of concepts for uh, some type of vulnerabilities like CSERF, it's rather easy to just run an HTML file that we actually exploited and see if it works or not, instead of going to find where that uh, functionality is and try to execute it and, and just remove the token. And not video POCs. This is something a lot of researchers uh, like to do. They just send in a video and say, here, here's the submission. Like, here's the vulnerability. Just look at this video. Well, videos tend to be long. They tend to be slow. And you can much, much faster reproduce, uh, reproduce an issue if you just look at the reproduction steps and do it yourself instead of looking at the video and then pausing it and going and following these steps. Cool. So this is, uh, this is what a good report and a bad report looks like. I, I call it a bad report, but it's maybe an unhelpful report, so to speak. Uh, so if you, if you see the, the report to your right, or, or a bad report, you can see that they're, they're reporting in XSS, but all they're giving us is just a, a post request. And the problem with this is, well, where is the post request? Like, how do you initiate this post request? Like, you can try and copy paste the uh, the post request into your session, but then you have to worry about cookies, you have to worry about CSERF tokens. You see there's an ID there, you have to guess what this ID is, probably swap it with your own ID just to get to that XSS. This is a lot of time, and all this time is, is going to cut into being efficient with a triage. So in such cases, it's a very good idea to just push back to the researcher and just tell them, hey, this is not helpful, can you please provide more details? And a good report is, uh, the one uh, that you see here. So it basically tells you where to go, what URL. You have to click this button, and you have to see this request in Burp, and then you have to modify some stuff to get to the XSS. This is really, a, it's a good report, and it takes time to write it up, but it will make your process a lot faster. So if you see this report, you can totally uh, reproduce it very easy and just move forward with it. Uh, so in order to be efficient, again, uh, in, in triaging, there's a couple of, of points that is really important to take care of. And these are supposed to be like top, top to bottom or whatever. Uh, so the first thing, when, when you get a submission, you're trying to validate it. The first thing you want to make sure is that the domain they're reporting it on, the target, and also the vulnerability type both are in scope. In scope. So if you, if you spend time reproducing an issue and then just to figure out that, oh, this, this issue is not in scope, um, or, or this target is not in scope, then that time is wasted because uh, you reproduce an issue and, um, and you're, you're not interested in it. So just make sure that the vulnerability is, is in scope, the type as well as the target. Uh, the second thing you want to make sure is that it's not a duplicate. So in bug bounties, just the first submission gets rewarded. Everything else is called out as a duplicate and gets no reward. Again, same thing applies. You spend time to reproduce an issue, then you find out it's a duplicate. That time is wasted. You let the researcher know, but your time is wasted. 
So once you make sure that it's actually in scope and it's not a duplicate, you can start reproducing the issues. The first thing to look at is replication steps. Uh, but doing a lot of validation or just being a security uh, professional, you know what an XSS is or an IDOR or whatever. As long as it's not a super complicated chain of vulnerabilities, you don't need to have a description of the vulnerability. You just need to know where it is so you can go reproduce the issue. So looking at the reproduction steps and starting to, to reproduce the issue is the next thing you want to do to make sure that this, this vulnerability is valid or is invalid. Um, you want to make sure that you have accounts ready uh, so there's a ton of applications that have different roles in the application and, and researchers will try to look for IDORs with different kinds of roles. So you want to make sure you have accounts ready that have different roles. And in best case scenario, you have two accounts for each role because then you, you get IDORs which, uh, which you need to test with two accounts. And if you have to first create those accounts, set those roles, that's again time that is just going to eat into the triage process. You should also have multiple browsers ready because there's a lot of submissions that just work on WebKit, for example, or some issues just work on IE. And if you have to spin up a virtual machine and install Windows just to test it on IE, that's a problem. So just make sure that you have multiple browsers ready to test issues that are specific to one browser. And of course, you want to have an intercepting proxy ready for a lot of submissions. You will need it. So uh, the way I do it, I just keep it open all the time and let the browser through it. So whenever I need it, it's there and it makes it fast. Uh, and also you want to have the scope ready. So um, if, especially in the beginning of a bug bounty, you will find yourself referencing the scope a lot because you want to make sure that the submission they are sending in is with the right target and the right type. So you have to go back and look at the scope. When these scopes tend to be pretty detailed and pretty long, which is something you can keep in mind, like just looking one time at it. And the last thing is when you validate that the submission is valid, uh, it's a good idea to rename the title or whatever tag you want to put on this. Uh, for when you're looking at for duplicates. This is very, very helpful when you're going to start searching for duplicates and, and uh, check if a submission that you're looking at was reported before or not. If you have a bad description of a title, you're just looking through, through submissions that, you, uh, that came in before, and this is going to eat time again. Cool. So communication is also very important. So researchers have been around and done a lot of bug bounties. And the worst thing that can happen as a, to a researcher, and uh, this I speak from experience here, is just the radio silence that some companies do. Like you submit something and they triage it and say, hey, we're looking into it. And then you get nothing for months. And this is really bad for a researcher. And they will start asking. They will start asking, hey, what's the status of my submission? Have you started fixing it? Have you validated it? Am I going to get a reward or not? So you can, you can all of this, you can, you can stop by just letting them know the status, what you're doing. Even if you're just looking at it, just let them know, hey, we're looking into this issue. Or hey, we're having, uh, we're having someone look into it in, in this specific time. And then researchers feel secure that they actually been taken care of. And you can, uh, you can not receive a lot of uh, status updates, which also will take uh, time. And of course, yeah, stay on top of the issues because uh, that's important. Cool. Define a rating taxonomy for the vulnerabilities you receive. Um, it's, it's really good for a couple of points. First of all, it will speed up the program because when you validate a submission, having a rating taxonomy makes it really easy to, to define the security impact that issue has. And that turns into the next point, which says you can also easily find a reward for this because if you have a rating taxonomy that tells you what the criticality of the submission is, you can easily define a reward for that uh, submission. And of course, it also helps to see, uh, to track the, the posture of your organization, uh, whether as to are you doing good or bad based on the submissions that you're receiving. And if you want to make this public, this is even more helpful. First of all, for the researchers, because they get a sense of, of safety by looking at what you care about, what you don't care about. So it, it will help them not submit stuff that is really low priority or just you don't just care about, which we call won't fix. And um, it will. Uh, it will help them focus on high priority issues and you get more of that, which is more value. And this rating taxonomy is not just a, a document that you once write up and just put it out there. It's something that should be discussed within the company and should be made changes based on what you feel is critical for the company and what you feel is you don't care about. Like based on the application, uh, you will know what, what you want to care about and what you don't care about in the submissions. Uh, so you can also, uh, 
while discussing the, the rating taxonomy, it's also good to discuss interesting bugs that you, uh, that you uh, get via the bug bounty, because that will help probably change processes or the development lifecycle and just make your applications more secure. Cool. So there's a couple of horror stories that while doing uh, validation, I figured they are funny, so I just wanted to bring them up here. I don't know if you can see them. Uh, so just like uh, before I start here, I just want to let everybody know that these are all invalid submissions. Uh, so the first one is uh, a researcher who thinks, uh, who I think has a PhD in cryptography because he is sending something with key exchange vulnerabilities, but the book type is SQL injection. This is definitely not valid. So another one is uh, really interesting where the researcher reports XSS and his suggestion is to actually take the, the XSS payload and put it in the developer toolbar. He says it's a vulnerability, but it's actually an intended functionality. Um, another one that's really interesting, content security policy must patch soon. Everybody knows that CSP is a real vulnerability, so have to fix it. Um, this one is interesting for the fact that the, uh, the researcher just figured that putting the whole submission in the title somehow will make it stand out from other vulnerabilities. That's not the case. And the last one is terms and conditions. So nobody will read your terms and conditions. That's false. The researcher will read them and they will find vulnerabilities in there. Um, of course, there's not just horror stories. There's a lot of success stories. One of them is a company called Instructure. Uh, they had a pen test in 2013. They decided to do a bug bounty instead in 2014. And you can see the results in the slides. So just by having this crowd of people looking at your applications, you will get a lot more benefit. And as you can see for them, that it turned from one high priority in a pen test into 25 high priority issues in uh, 2014. So the too long didn't read here is bug bounties are super effective. Everybody should run a bug bounty and uh, it just takes preparation to do that. If you have questions, uh, please let us know. Thank you. Yep. Uh, the question was, what's a good way to announce a bug bounty program, Grant? Um, I think just putting the word out there, um, I mean, you're, so you probably want to bar work with your marketing and PR teams, uh, you know, whether that goes out on Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. Um, generally speaking, when you, if you launch a new bug bounty program, uh, I mean, and you can also, I was going to say put it on, put it on like a, a platform that people already look at, like Bug Crowd, et cetera. But, uh, I mean, if you launch your own personal bug bounty program, yeah, uh, just put it out uh, via, you know, your traditional marketing communications. And generally speaking, uh, maybe, maybe go on, uh, you know, Reddit and other places like that where, like, uh, security people will hang out and just try to sort of let it spread naturally. Uh, generally speaking, if you put up a bounty program, uh, researchers are typically going to find it. I mean, people talk in, in that sense. Cool. Yeah, so just to restate that so that everybody, or so that it's recorded. Um, so the first thing was that, uh, you know, uh, bug bounties and pen tests aren't the same thing. Uh, so comparing them is not necessarily fair. Absolutely. Like, uh, just to be clear, like, this isn't advocating uh, bug bounties replace pen tests. Uh, this is just showing the, the value, and I think, I mean, it's, it's kind of implicit, the value of having a lot of eyes looking at an application. Uh, by all means, uh, we, we strongly advocate that, you know, this is a supplement to your already existing uh, security programs. Um, and then the second point was, um, if you're starting a bug bounty program on your own, 
uh, make sure that you, instead of having just people send an email, uh, have them submit through a web form. That's an excellent point. Uh, yeah, we'll probably include that in future iterations because that's, that's absolutely true. It can force them to fill out fields as opposed to just an email that you then have to parse. Good, good point. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, oh yeah, sorry. Uh, so the question was, are there any good templates for briefs and uh, vulnerability rating, ratings? Um, so yeah, so uh, what BugRoute uh, has done is we've actually published our VRT. Uh, so Sven talked earlier about our VRT, uh, or you know, the, the vulnerability, vulnerability rating taxonomy. Uh, so that, that's just a document where we put every, you know, most common vulnerabilities uh, mapped to the OWASP top 10, uh, you know, and the, the yeah. Anyways, um, and you know, to respective priority levels, uh, you know, so where where things typically fall is won't fix P4s, P3s. We go P1 through five is how we we typically rate things, uh, and then examples of uh, good briefs. Um, yeah, you can generally see that. Um, well, I mean, like the examples that come to mind are you know uh, the the. The giants, right? Like so, Facebook and Google do pretty, pretty, really good jobs of, of you know, having independent bug bounty programs. Uh, and then, you know, if you want to look at, uh, you know, uh, programs that BugCrowd helps run, forward slash programs, so BugCrowd forward slash BugCrowd.com forward slash programs, and you can see what other people have put up up there, like uh, Tesla, etc. You can see, you know, how their briefs look. Does that help? Uh, so the question was, should you have any considerations towards teams or uh, individuals uh, in, in running a bug bounty program? Um, good question. Um, so generally speaking, um, I mean, we just typically treat everybody as individuals. If people want to work as teams, I think that we do have some people that, you know, submit under a shared account. Um, yeah, I, I, can't, um, I can't necessarily see how... I don't, I don't think that it would be handled any different than like handling an individual. Um, in, uh, would there be like an, a, a use case for that? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. So yeah. So that that was that was a recommend. Uh, so the 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 question was uh, in terms of like sharing T-shirts, right? So you can't share a T-shirt. Um, uh, yeah. Um, absolutely. Generally, we recommend cash. Uh, sharing a T-shirt. Yeah. Uh, that as as we mentioned. So we tried swag um, earlier, and and you know some programs still run off swag. Uh, whenever possible, uh, you know it's it's much easier to to just reward cash. Um, you know it's divisible as well as um, it's just generally easier like the the effort that goes into shipping things and and making sure that like all that the logistics behind all that uh, cash just is infinitely easier does that help kind of cool uh, back first and then we'll Um, that's, oh yeah, uh, so the question is, uh, advice for handling duplicates. Um, so that is a tough question. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and let Sven go cool. that one. Uh, yeah, so for, for duplicates, uh, there's always a, this is a question of trust, right? So if, if as a researcher you start working on a bug bounty program, first step is you have to trust the company that they are going to make the right decision, that they are not going to duplicate you and then just go fix the bug and not pay a reward, right? And the second, second solution would be to just use a platform. Uh, the platforms have actually evolved in trying to make this process uh, transparent uh, by actually, when, when you're duplicated against a submission, you get to see the whole submission or you get to see just a part of it and the date where it was submitted. So you can be, you can be sure that actually your submission is a duplicate of that submission and just 
sleep well at home. So in, in the platform, um, this would be a problem because the platform has rankings. And if you're, if you're, if you're going to uh, make this information public, oh, I'm sorry, I should have repeated the question. Uh, yeah, so the question is why, <laughs> well, I'm sorry. The question is why would you, uh, why would you not publish uh, the, the reports that you got, like this many XSS, this many CSERF uh, to the researchers. Uh, so yeah, in a platform, this is a problem because platforms have rankings and a duplicate will, uh, will affect that ranking. So researchers will actually go after the duplicates just to increase their ranking. Uh, and also, like as a company, uh, when, you're, when you're advertising the number of vulnerabilities you're getting, um, it's, it's a question of whether you want to do that and how that is going to affect your reputation. Is that enough answer? Thank you for coming. Um, that wasn't the question.